It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I didn't think this government could possibly mismanage the electricity system any worse than they already have. But then we learned from Fergie in the Toronto Star that the Liberals lost a landmark $25 million claim by the Windstream Energy. That doesn't include another $3 million in legal fees. But why are taxpayers on the hook for yet another Liberal scandal? Because they decided to sign a $5.2 billion energy contract for power that Ontario didn't need, and then cancelled the contract when a Liberal riding was about to revolt. Where have we seen this story before? Sounds a lot, uh, awfully like the cancelled gas. Stop the clock. Order, please. Please finish. Everything's a joke. Mr. Speaker, where have we seen this story before? Sounds a question. very similar to the gas plant scandal. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is when will they stop thinking about saving Liberal seats and actually think about hydro thank rate you. payers in the province of Ontario? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Energy will want to uh, speak in the sup to the supplementary, but um, just on the uh, issue around Windstream and the tribunal decision, Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that Ontario has been advised of uh, the tribunal's decision. The tribunal dismissed the majority of claims made against Canada, Ontario. I think uh, that's important, Mr. Speaker. And the final award was significantly less uh, than damages that were being sought by Windstream. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're looking at the uh, the decision, and we understand that Canada is doing the same in order to determine if there are next steps to be taken. Mr. Speaker, we are um, we're taking a cautious and a responsible approach to offshore wind to allow for the development of research and coordination. Um, that's why there's a Order. moratorium on offshore uh, wind development, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister of the Environment is finalizing research on the issue, including decommission requirements Answer. and noise over water. Those are issues that need to be resolved, Mr. Speaker, before we go forward. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. And the government may want to ignore Rob Ferguson's headline on this scandal, but you know what? The headline was also in the Ottawa Citizen with David Reveille, and it said, plain as day, Ontario to pay another $28 million for not producing electricity, this time from a U.S. wind farm. Yet again, there is nothing new with this Liberal government and their failed hydro policies. They have already given away six billion dollars of energy since 2009. Ontario has been powering New York and Pennsylvania for years. Now we are paying U.S. companies to produce nothing, to produce no electricity. Mr. Speaker, enough is enough. When will this government learn? Directly to the Premier, why is it fair for Ontario families to pay for your scandals and bad contracts? You see the I, I, I do want to remind the leader it's not directly to the Premier, it's to the Chair. Thank you. Premier. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister of Energy will speak in the, supp the final supplementary. Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that the leader of the third party does not support renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. I know that the leader of the opposition does not. Sorry, I think I said third party. I meant the leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition does not support renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. of the opposition does not in fact acknowledge that there is a lot more that we have to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in this uh, province Mr. Speaker and that the shutting down of the coal-fired plants was the single largest initiative that uh, has been accomplished and been completed in North America Mr. Speaker we are going to continue Answer. to work with the renewable industry Mr. Speaker tens of thousands of jobs have been created and we will continue to make sure that we have a clean electricity grid in Ontario
Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. This $28 million payout may not be the last we've heard about this scandal. In fact, the tribunal that made the $28 million ruling declared the contract is formally in force and has not been terminated by the Liberals. That's a $5.2 billion contract. Again, for energy, we do not need. Mr. Speaker, how will this government pay for this $5.2 billion contract? Are ratepayers and taxpayers on the hook for a scandal that could be five times the size of the gas plant scandal? Mr. Speaker, I would appreciate no diversions, no talking points, a clear answer on this question about a 5.2 billion mega scandal this government got themselves into again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise to answer the uh, Leader of the Opposition's question. As the Premier outlined, Ontario has been advised of the Tribunal's decision in the NAFTA Chapter 11 dispute. The Tribunal dismissed the majority of claims, with the final $25 oh. million award being significantly less than up, the, up to the $568 million damages sought by, by Windstream, Mr. Speaker. But I find it very interesting, Mr. Speaker, that this party, just a couple of weeks ago, was talking about ripping up contracts for renewable energy that would cost this province billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. But rather than recognizing that their plan is not a plan, Mr. Speaker, that they don't even have one, Mr. Speaker, we eliminated coal, we've coal. done the heavy lifting, and we're very proud of our record, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This morning, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce confirmed that life is harder under this Liberal government. 38 per cent of small businesses say hydro prices are the number one obstacle they face to remain competitive in Ontario, and one in three small businesses have said hydro prices will lead to them delaying and cancelling investments and expansions in Ontario. This Premier and this government has lost touch with Main Street Ontario and the hard-working people that create jobs. Mr. Speaker, how many more small businesses will have to close their doors before this Premier realizes her energy policies are reckless, out of touch and dangerous for Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, Minister of Economic Development is just uh, eager to, uh, to speak to this. But, Mr. Speaker, let me, let me just say that we're very sympathetic to small businesses in the province. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in the throne speech, you will know that one of the prongs of our, uh, of our plan was to expand the access to the, uh, the Industrial Conservation Initiative to smaller businesses so that not only the 300 businesses that had access, Remember but another 1,000 businesses order. would have access. But, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that our economic growth across Ontario is uh, outstripping that of uh, other parts of the country and, and North America, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, uh, in fact, um, mo almost all of the G7 countries, Mr. Speaker, did not see as high real GDP growth as Ontario has, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So we are doing better. Uh, there are jobs being created in this province by the private sector, including by small businesses, because of the conditions that we're putting in place, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. It's not just mom and pop shops around Ontario that are having trouble. It's small business startups and companies hiring in the skilled trades. The Chamber of Commerce released a fascinating stat that said that nearly 40 per cent of employees are struggling to fill in a job opening over the past year and a half because of the skills mismatch that we see in Ontario today, because the company couldn't find the right person for the right job with the right qualifications. For over 13 years, this government has done nothing to address the skills mismatch in the province of Ontario. The Chamber of Commerce has pointed it out very plainly. 40 per cent of those jobs they can't fill because you're not producing young people down the educational pathways that will lead to a job. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, will the Liberals take this advice from the Chamber of question. Commerce? Will you deal with the skills mismatch in the province of Ontario? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, we don't only take the advice very seriously of our Chamber of Commerce. We've worked in partnership with that chamber for over a decade now, Mr. Speaker, to make Ontario the most uh, generous place in, in North America now when it comes to Remember working with Lattner, small business. There's a reason why, Mr. Speaker, we're leading the G7 in growth, Mr. Speaker, and part of that is because our small businesses, our startups, are excelling here. There's a reason why venture capital is up 251 percent. Because 
because they're investing in our talent. Mr. Speaker, we're working very, very closely with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. They've written a report, Mr. Speaker, that completely aligns very much with the, the work we're doing. They praised us, Mr. Speaker, on some of the things we're doing to give our small businesses breaks in, uh, in energy rates. And, Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep working with them to build a, uh, an economy that we'll be proud to pass on to our kids Thank and you. grandkids. Stop the clock. Remind the member not to hold a prop, please. That, that's not helpful at all. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, to hear Liberal ministers say that the Chamber of Commerce report is aligned with the government, it was an indictment of the government. Have they not even read the report? You know, since the minister hasn't read the report, I'll say you, I'll, I'll share with you right here in the legislature exactly what the report said. It said that small businesses in Ontario, half of small businesses in Ontario, feel that Ontario is worse off than it was five years ago. Half of small businesses. Is it any wonder why they feel that way? We're a province that is mired in debt, over $300 billion in debt. We have the second highest tax burden in the country for businesses. We have grade six students failing in math and nearly 40 businesses can't find a young person to fill the job that they need to hire. And this government thinks things are rosy. You are killing small businesses in this question. province. And my question is, rather than saying everything is rosy, will you listen to the Chamber of Commerce for once? You say it, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, nothing but rhetoric coming from that leader of the opposition. Nothing but rhetoric. You have no right to talk down a small business community, Mr. Speaker, that's seen as the best in all of North America. Our startups here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, are the most sought after startups anywhere in North America today, if not anywhere in the world. And, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to listening to our chamber, we've been listening. We continue to work in partnership with them. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we had a capital tax in this province. 2010, capital tax gone. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we lowered our, our corporate in income tax down by 1 per cent. Now, Mr. Speaker, a, a company in the U.S. is paying 13 per cent more in capital tax than our companies. That's why we set up a Southwest Ontario Development Fund and an Eastern Ontario Development Fund. 32,000 people in this, this province, Mr. Speaker, are working because of that fund. We will continue to work with our Ontario Chamber of Commerce. We will continue to reduce regulatory burden and be a global model for reducing regulatory burden because, Mr. Speaker, we're determined to work with our Ontario Chamber to pass on our Minister, I stand, you sit. New question. A member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Is the government planning to privatize eHealth and Ontario's digital health assets? Mr. Speaker, there is no possibility of the sale or the commercial use of uh, people's health information. We've been very, very clear about the minister about that. The minister has said that we're looking to improve the health care uh, and service that patients receive as part of a digital uh, strategy moving forward. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health wrote to Ed Clark seeking expert advice to assess the value of Ontario's digital health uh, system, Mr. Speaker, and program its assets and all the related intellectual property, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the infrastructure in which we have invested uh, over years. Um, the eHealth mandate, and I don't know if the uh, member opposite knows, but the, the mandate of, of eHealth Ontario expires at the end of 2017. So we believe that we've presented, been presented with an opportunity to, uh, to determine the, uh, the result of the investments that have been made, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and to determine if there are changes that need to be made and uh, what the value of those investments has uh, produced, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. 
And yet, the Minister of Health wrote to Ed Clark last week asking him to look at eHealth specifically because of his experience in valuing public and private assets. Let's be honest, his experience in valuing public assets means selling public assets. Yep. After all, in 2014, when the Premier asked Mr. Clark to maximize the value of government business enterprises, we know that that was a public relations friendly way of saying sell off Hydro One. Is this Premier looking for a way to hide a Liberal plan to privatize digital health assets? No. No, Mr. Speaker. And I will say that uh, Canada Health Infoway has estimated roughly a billion dollars in annual benefits to Ontario as a result of the investments that have been made in eHealth Ontario yeah, and almost $6 billion in cumulative benefits since 2007. So, Mr. Speaker, it's true that the Minister of Health has asked Ed, because, Ed Clark, because of his experience, to do an assessment of, uh, of the results of those investments, Mr. Speaker. I think it's responsible as eHealth reaches the end of its mandate in 2017. That we understand the value of those investments, Mr. Speaker, and we look at whether there is a way to, uh, to uh, understand the value of those digital assets and move towards a new vision for digital health in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the member opposite lives in the Waterloo region. She knows how fast technology That's changes. Right. She knows right. how important it is that we keep up and make the best decisions on this digital strategy. That's what this assessment is about, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you. Uh, the people in Waterloo Region also know high, how high their energy costs are, for sure, Ms. Premier. On October 21, 2015, the Premier stood right there in her place, and she said, we're not selling off the assets. Less than a month later, Ed Clark said it was a bold step. It showed political courage to sell Hydro One. This is why people have a hard time believing that this Premier isn't planning to spring another false surprise on the people of Ontario. Should Ontarians be getting ready for another, another Liberal sell-off? No, Mr. Speaker, um, as I said, we have, the Minister of Health has asked Ed Clark to do an assessment of eHealth Ontario. In much the way I will use the, the example of the LCBO, Mr. Speaker, Ed Clark did an assessment of the LCBO. There are changes that are being made to the, uh, the liquor laws in this province, Mr. Speaker. There are changes that have come about as a result of the work that Ed Clark did, Mr. Speaker. But there is no there is no sell-off of, uh, of that asset. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to look at eHealth. We're going to look at the work that's been done and look at the investments that have been made and what the results are, Mr. Speaker, and understand how we move forward to make sure that people in this province have the best digital health strategy possible, Mr. Speaker. They deserve that. We need to keep up, and we need to make sure that we leverage all of the, uh, all of the technology yes, that is available to people in the 21st century and make sure it works for the people of the province and their health care. Thank you. Okay. New question, member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you again to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. There's a big difference between the LCBO and people's medical records yeah. in this province of Ontario. And it's not, it's not just New Democrats that have these concerns. On Thursday, the Ontario Medical Association wrote to Ed Clark saying, we are particularly concerned to read in media reports that the government may be seeking to monetize this data gathering ability for profit. Will the government rule out privatizing people's confidential medical records? Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased. You know, I saw the letter from Virginia Wally. I'm very pleased that the OMA uh, agrees with us that patient information is not and will not and never should be uh, up for sale, Mr. Speaker. I think that is, uh, that's a fundamental and a given that we should all agree to in this House, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, there has been a huge investment in uh, e-health. We know from uh, an initial report from Canada Health in Infoway that uh, an estimated a uh, billion dollars in annual benefits to Ontario as a result of the investments that have been made, and almost six billion dollars in cumulative benefits since 20, 2007, Mr. Speaker. So we need to make sure that we understand the value of what has been produced because of those investments. We uh, we need to understand how we can move forward to provide the best digital health service, the best digital Answer. strategy for the people of Ontario. That's the work that we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You cannot blame the people of this province for having serious trust issues when this government starts talking about privatization. And it's not just New Democrats, it's also the Ontario Health Coalition who have concerns. After reading the minister's letter, the coalition said they are, and I quote, deeply concerned that the bias of this valuation exercise will be towards for-profit privatization. And again, I quote, they say the privatization of patient records puts the confidentiality of patient records in jeopardy of being compromised. Will the government rule out privatization of medical records and not go back on your word later on? Mr. Speaker, I've done that. I have ruled that out. I've said that you know we uh, we agree with uh, with the member opposite that uh, patient information, uh, people's health information, should never be compromised, Mr. Speaker. And we agree with the OMA that patient information should not be up for sale. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, there may be opportunities to partner or work with others in medical, hospital, and related sectors to build on the assets that have been created by the. Uh, investments that have been made by the, uh, the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and, and find ways to serve people and patients even better. Mr. Speaker, we have, uh, we have a, a minister in government, the Minister of uh, Advanced Education, who has responsibility for a digital strategy government-wide, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure that everything we're doing in the health care sector Mr. Speaker, provides the best digital strategy, the best digital service, and the most efficient for the people of Ontario in their health care. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this government also said that they would not sell off Hydro One, and they went ahead and they did that as well. It's not just doctors and the Health Coalition. Hospital workers say, and I quote, health records are confidential, containing information that should be not be plucked for its potential asset value to the provincial Liberal government. The Premier doesn't have a mandate to privatize health records from Ontarians, and it's clear doctors are worried, health care workers and advocates are worried, and hospital workers are worried, and they have good reason to be worried. Who has given this Premier a mandate to privatize digital health care in the province of Ontario? Responsible for digital government. Minister responsible for digitization. Well, thank you, Speaker. And let me be abundantly clear: e-health is not for sale. Personal health information is not and will not be for sale, Speaker. But let's take this opportunity to see the progress that has been made as a result of e-health. A decade ago, Remember almost 770,000 Ontarians had access to EMRs. Now it's over 10 million. Speaker, uh, trauma patients have access to neurosurgery 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Telemedicine, remote clinical consultations, are over half a million each year. Speaker, people are getting the care they need where they are where they live, not where the physician is, where the specialist is. Speaker Olis, uh, almost 3 billion uh, lab, uh, lab results, Answer. about 9.5 million Ontarians. E-health has made a profound difference in the health care, and we need to make sure we're doing it to its you. max. Speaker. New question. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. But she may want to pass this on to the Minister of Infrastructure. That's because on February 17th, when I asked him about the lawsuit from Windstream, he said this, and I quote, The member opposite is assuming that the case has been lost. When the case has been determined, I'd be happy to answer the premise of his question. Well, Speaker, the case has now been lost and the outcome determined, and the taxpayers will be on the hook for at least $28 million. Windstream further claims that their $500 million contract is still valid. And there's still another $653 million lawsuit outstanding from Mesa Power. Yeah. So I'll ask the same question again. Yeah. We know the cancelled gas plants cost $1.1 billion. Yeah. Will the Premier admit that taxpayers may be on the hook for billions more because of Question. her additional seat-saving energy, liberal energy fiasco? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer my uh, honourable colleague's question. And I think it's very important, uh, Mr. Speaker, to say that Ontario is carefully reviewing the decision, and we understand that Canada is doing the same in order to determine next steps, Mr. Speaker. So let's re reiterate. We were advised last week of the tribunal's decision. Uh, the tribunal dismissed the majority of claims, with the final $25 million award being significantly less than up to the $568 million in damages sought by Windstream. 
And Mr. Speaker, the decision to place a moratorium on offshore wind is one our government still believes is correct, and that's why we're going to continue to take a cautious approach to offshore wind, Mr. Speaker, which includes finalizing research to make sure that we are protective of both human health and the environment, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, the PC Party maintained there would never be offshore wind in the Great Lakes, and if they'd have made that decision, you wouldn't be in the courts. Yep. Once again, the Liberals irresponsibly tried to save seats in Scarborough and Kingston, and the yep. taxpayers are left with the bill. Yep. And when the final cost is eventually revealed, yep. it is always much worse. Remember when cancelling the gas plants was only going to cost $40 million, Speaker? Yep. And then there's Trillium Wind Power Corp, loss, a lawsuit that is ongoing because the government once again deleted emails and destroyed evidence. Dodge, deny, that lawsuit, as a result of Liberals playing politics, is for $2.25 billion. Speaker, we now know that the gas, canceled gas plants cost over a billion dollars. Yep. Will the Premier admit that the Ontario taxpayers could be on the hook for billions more because of your energy mismanagement? Dodge, deny, delete. Can you say that, please? Can you say that, please? Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'll reiterate, Ontario is carefully reviewing the decision, and we're working with uh, the Canadian government in doing the same to uh, determine our next steps. But as the, uh, the uh, uh, member from the opposition mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that they would have never invested in renewables. Exactly that, Mr. Speaker. They would invest in coal, PC pro-coal party, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated coal. We've done the heavy lifting on this side, Mr. Speaker, and we are very proud of that record. And we will continue to look at ways to to actually save our ratepayers' money, Mr. Speaker. We did that by suspending the LRP2, Mr. Speaker. And this is something that this party doesn't have, Mr. Speaker, is a plan on energy. They have no idea, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. New question? The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. United Way of Bruce Gray recently declared rural energy poverty to be a public health crisis. When rural families lose hydro, they not only lose their TV, they could lose their well pump, their drinking water, their toilet, the necessities of life. United Way found that in urban areas, the average hydro bill arrears is $700. But in rural areas, the average arrears is over $1,200. Wow. But the maximum relief available to rural families who heat with electricity is just $600. Last month, the government promised rural rate relief, but we now know that most rural families will not get this relief. Will the government at least increase emergency assistance for rural families Question. who face skyrocketing hydro bills? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased uh, to rise and answer the question from the member from the third party. Um, rural rates is something that we've identified as an issue because we've been hearing from Ontarians over the last several months, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we brought forward uh, an increase to the triple RP in our speech from the throne. 330,000 families across the province will benefit from this, Mr. Speaker. They will see a significant savings on top of their bill. We also have six programs in place. Mr. Speaker, six programs that will help these families, specifically families, seniors that uh, you know live in rural areas, seniors that heat their homes with electricity. They can see up to $75 a month, Mr. Speaker, on top of the other programs that we have, and in addition to the um, to the 20% uh, that they'll see off the reduction through their triple RP, Mr. Speaker. We know this is an issue, and we've identified it, and we've acted on it very quickly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Well, Speaker, again to the Premier, a family that heats with natural gas and is struggling to pay its energy bills can get up to $500 to help pay their natural gas bill, and they can get another $500 to help pay their hydro bill. That's a total of $1,000 in emergency assistance for struggling families living in areas with natural gas. But rural and northern families who do not have access to natural gas and must heat with electricity have access to a maximum of just $600 in total emergency assistance. Rural and northern families already have the highest energy bills in the province. Why is their total emergency assistance capped at $400 less than what exists in urban areas? Thank you. Yes, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the honourable member for uh, pointing uh, some of those facts out, Mr. Speaker. It is important for me to say we're looking at every possible opportunity to help families right across the province. Mr. And I Michael. should emphasize, Mr. Speaker, that there is the LEAP program that I believe he mentioned at the $600 uh, uh, amount for helping families. Michael. But there is also uh, on the electricity side, Mr. Speaker, uh, up to $75 a month for uh, for seniors and those who heat their homes with electricity. And that's most of those folks that live in northern and rural areas, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. So when you add that all together, Mr. Speaker, on top of the Northern Ontario tax rebate program, Mr. Speaker, and eliminating the DRC, we've done a lot to ensure that we're helping families uh, in rural and northern uh, communities, Mr. Speaker. But we'll make sure that we continue to look at ways that we can continue to help, Mr. Speaker. That's been uh, part of my mandate since I've taken over this uh, portfolio Answer. over 120 some days now, Mr. Speaker. And we'll continue to find ways to help families right across Thank the you. province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, we know that water is a precious resource and Ontario is truly blessed with it. Over the summer, communities across the province experienced drought conditions, and in some areas, it was quite severe. It raises concerns about our water resources and water security. Last month, the Premier and the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change announced that the government will be taking a closer look at water management across the province. This is an important issue for all Ontarians, and we want to ensure that we address this by taking a rational, evidence-based approach and respond to community concerns. Now, today, the announcement was made on the completion of that review. Speaker, could the minister please inform the House Portia. of the details of that announcement? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member uh, from Kitchener Centre because she played a very significant role in this. She comes from a water-stressed uh, area of the province, as uh, does the President of Treasury Board, the member for Guelph. And I also want to thank the Premier. Uh, it's always helpful when you want to do something when the Premier directs you to do it. Things move quite quickly, and only a couple of months after that direction, here we are uh, with a moratorium for two years, Mr. Speaker, that uh, will ensure that there are uh, no new expansions and no new capacity increases while we review in detail to look at the issues that have arisen with climate change and other matters of local water security and concern, important to residents, Mr. Speaker, our farm community, and many of our businesses. Um, the rules will also be upgraded for existing water pumping, which will require greater Answer. greater science, and we will be reducing the permitting period from 10 to 5 years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplement. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister. I know he cares passionately about this issue. Passionate. Today's announcement clearly demonstrates that this government is committed to protecting the environment, specifically our groundwater resources. Ontario's drinking water continues to be among the best protected in North America. And you can see this from our strict health-based drinking water standards to comprehensive legislation that does protect water resources. There is a safety net that ensures the quality of our drinking water. Today's announcement further safeguards this precious resource. Speaker, could the minister please offer more insights on today's announcement and also information on how we can encourage all Ontarians to choose tap water whenever possible, which is safe, reliable, cost-effective and convenient? Thank you. Minister. Thanks, uh, Mr. Well, Speaker. Down. And uh, we should give a shout out to our many municipalities and the Aqua Water Utility because we do have some of the best drinking water and the safest drinking water now in the world after many, many years. But we also have very inexpensive water, uh, 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 I'd, I'd say, Mr. Speaker. And uh, right now, uh, it is some of the cheapest in the world. So one of the things that we will be re reviewing is the pricing system uh, and the cost of that to better reflect that. We'll also be looking at ground source water as a particular challenge because many people who use water, Mr. Speaker, take water out of the ground uh, and don't put it back, where others, others do put it back. So we have to be very cognizant about the price and about the challenges in water-stressed areas, which much of the Guelph and Cambridge uh, Kitchener area is, yes, to ensure that we have a higher standard and that our pricing system reflects conservation and, and fair cost recovery. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Lampton, Kent, Minnesota. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. 
Saturday's Toronto Sun featured an important story about manufacturers who have formed a coalition to stand up to this Liberal government's policies, policies which are putting good jobs at risk by making Ontario no longer viable for companies like theirs. The coalition of concerned manufacturers is growing rapidly and already represents thousands of good jobs across Ontario. Speaker, Jocelyn Williams Bamford Chief of Governor Automatic Rep. Coding, a founding member of the coalition, said, and I quote, We don't worry about our competition anymore. We fear the government. Fear oh, well, the government. Ah, Speaker, fear. how can the minister continue to support policies that have companies spending more resources fighting this government than growing their businesses Question. and creating jobs in the province of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, no government has ever supported our, our small business community more than this government has, whether it be by helping them grow their businesses with supports that that, that party opposite does not support, whether it be by reducing regulatory burden, whether it be by giving them breaks on their energy bills. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with that sector. But I'll tell you something else we're doing, Mr. Speaker, that that party doesn't support. We're working with our auto sector in manufacturing to ensure that Oshawa has a future because because of the partnerships that you do not support and we support, because Brampton's uh, FCA auto plant has a future because of the investments we're making in our auto sector, Mr. Speaker, investments that that leader and that party call corporate welfare. Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep investing with our, our manufacturing partners, we're going to keep growing this economy, and we're going to keep leading Answer. this country in growth. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. The Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers has a clear message for this government. Better than giving us money would be policies that aren't bankrupting us. Here, here. Speaker, this coalition, like thousands of businesses across the province, aren't looking for government handouts. They simply want policies that aren't designed to run them out of town. Speaker, the Liberal government has lost over 300,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs. Is it time to admit that this government's policies of expensive energy, over-regulation and high debt has led to hundreds of companies choosing to leave this province? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, the opposite is actually true. Mr. Speaker, I was just at an investment mission in California. I met with eight companies. Four of them are coming here, Mr. Speaker. Four of them are making plans to come here in the very near future. Eight for eight. Mr. Speaker, they're coming here because we have better talent, because we've invested in our talent, Mr. Speaker. They're coming here because we have a, lo a lower cost, Mr. Speaker, for those companies to operate here, substantially lower, in some cases 40 to 60 percent lower. They're coming here, Mr. Speaker, because we partner with our business community. Unlike the party opposite, we work in partnership with them. Second time, member from Renfrew. Finish, please. He said, Mr. Speaker, we will keep listening to our business community. We'll keep listening to our small businesses. Yes, we'll keep working in, in unison with them, and we will keep acting to make Ontario the most competitive place in North Thank America you. to do business. Question: The member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, later today, Ryerson University will release a study that is labeled, quote, a public health crisis in the making that reveals the devastating toll that temp agency work can take on workers. In some cases, after childcare and deductions are paid to the temp agency, these employees make as little as $3 an hour, Speaker. Shame. $3 dollars an hour in 2016. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to increase the province's minimum wage to $15 an hour and ensure that part-time temporary agency workers receive the same pay for the same work as they often do standing right next to other employees? Thank you. Mr. Labour. Mr. Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. It's a very important question because I think in Certainly on this side of the House, we realize that employees deserve to be treated fairly at work and they have the right to work in a safe workplace, Speaker. We're committed as a government to ensuring the strongest protection for those workers. We recognize, Speaker, and I think a number of people in this House have brought it up, 
saying that greater protection is something that we need to look at for those people that work at temporary help agencies. And that, Speaker, is why we launched the Changing Workplaces Review, is to do an in-depth examination of all the issues that are affecting Ontario's employees today as the economy is changing, Speaker. We've been out consulting, we've consulted with business, we've, we've consulted with labour, we've consulted with the advocacy group, Speaker, and I will tell you that last Friday was the last day for consultations. Wow. The interim report is out. Some of the recommendations have been outlined as options Answer. for the government, Speaker. I suspect we're going to see some, uh, some good discussion on this, Speaker, and some much-needed change. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, New Democrats don't think that three out of every ten workers in this province should have to struggle in conditions one of the researchers called modern-day slavery. It's time to ensure that temporary workers earn the same wage as permanent workers. If you're doing the same work, you should get the same pay. People deserve to be able to plan for a future for their families and not have to compromise their well-being, and they deserve to know that there will be a future there for the next generation. Will the, pre will the Premier listen to the evidence and ensure that temporary and part-time workers in this province receive the same wage for the same work? Okay. Speaker, I want to thank the member again for the important question that he's just asked. With the Changing Workplaces Review, Speaker, we went out and we wanted to protect employees and we want to support Ontario business. I think that is something that anybody in this chamber would want, Speaker. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank everybody from all the sectors yep. of our society that have stepped forward and have given us their best advice. And it's reports just like the members outlined. The one that's come out of Ryerson University, right. Speaker, that just demonstrates how important and how necessary it is that we do this in-depth examination. As I said, Speaker, the formal consultation ended last Friday, and people have stepped forward, Speaker. We've heard from people from business, from labour, advocacy, advocacy groups, large business, small business. The interim report, Speaker, them. is online. It remains available online. We're looking Answer. forward to the recommendations, the type of input that's contained in the Ryerson report to move forward on this Thank important you. issue, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Kingston and the Irish. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, today is the United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. Today presents an opportunity to acknowledge the effort and struggle of people living in poverty and a chance for them to make their concerns heard. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of millions of people across the world still live in poverty. However, it is important for us to recognize that poverty does not just exist outside our borders. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians are also living in poverty. I know that this government is committed to breaking the cycle of poverty for children and youth, helping people achieve employment and income security, and ending chronic homelessness in Ontario. Speaker, would the minister from the House uh, please inform Ontar uh, Ontar on Ontario's progress in reducing poverty? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for the question. And I am happy to rise today on behalf of the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy to highlight a couple of examples of our progress. In 2015, we indexed the Ontario Child Benefit to inflation. As a result, the maximum benefit rose to $1,336 per child under 18, supporting nearly 1 million children in more than 500,000 low to moderate income families. Also, through the Healthy Smiles Ontario program, we are providing access to free preventive, routine and emergency dental services to over 300,000 low-income children and youth. Of course, there's more work to be done, and we must continue to work with all of our partners, including businesses, communities, advocates and service delivery agencies to find Answer. sustainable and meaningful ways to eradicate poverty. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I'm glad to hear of the progress our government is making in reducing poverty in Ontario. Speaker, I understand that one of the four pillars of Ontario's new poverty reduction strategy is investing in evidence-based programming. Through the Local Poverty Reduction Fund, our government is working with community partners to fund programs and interventions that work for people. In 2015 alone, Ontario has invested $12.6 million in 41 
on local projects in 20 communities. My community is one of those. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing the results of these investments in our communities, and just last week I had the opportunity to announce the Chippy investment at home-based housing of $4,116,861. Can the minister please Question. share with the House more information about the local poverty reduction fund? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, to support the poverty reduction strategy's focus on evidence-based social policy, our government is investing $50 million over six years towards the local poverty reduction fund. Grant recipients are required to evaluate the success of their programs. One of the recipients of the fund last year was Food Share Toronto. This organization works with communities and schools to deliver healthy food and provide food education. Through their proposal, we will be able to determine whether these programs are improving access to fresh foods and whether they are helping families eat more healthily. We know that it is more important than ever that we measure our results and invest in initiatives that work. And Mr. Speaker, our government looks forward to announcing the 2016 grant recipients in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker. Your question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week the Premier showed Ontarians just how out of touch she is. At an event held by Niagara's Chamber of Commerce, the Premier had the audacity to call Ontarians very bad actors with regards to the environment. If you ask me, Speaker, I think that the Premier is a very bad actor herself when she pretends to care for Ontarians. Speaker, really and truly, all the Premier cares about is her cap-and-trade cash grab that will take more hard-earned dollars out of Ontario pockets so she can send those Order. dollars to big business in California. Will the Premier stand in this House and apologize to the people of Ontario for her inexcusable comments last week? Mr. Speaker, I have, I have said publicly at least twice that I shouldn't have used that language. I recognize that, uh, that that language was taken in a way that I certainly did not intend it. Mr. Speaker, here's what I was saying. I was saying that we have a lot more to do as Ontarians, as Canadians, yep. Mr. Speaker, yes, as people who live in a northern, industrialized, country, Mr. Speaker. We have a large carbon footprint. We've done a lot. Ontarians have led the way, Mr. Speaker. We shut down all the coal-fired plants. We have a strong renewable industry, Mr. Speaker. We have a 90 per cent emissions-free electricity grid. But what I was saying in that conversation was that there is more to do, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to lead as Ontarians, and we are leading the country, Mr. Speaker. Now we have a federal government that finally wants to work with us. Now Canadians can be you see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier, Speaker. I did not hear an apology. Life has gotten harder under the Premier's watch. Small businesses in Huron Bruce are asking why they have to keep paying for the debt retirement charge until 2018 when the charge is finally off the residential bills. And on top of that, consumers want transparency on their gas bills to see the true cost of cap and trade. But unfortunately, the Premier has chosen to bury that. How dare the Premier arrogantly claim Ontarians are bad actors when this Premier's bad policy and wasteful spending yep. continues to hurt their pocketbooks? Speaker, will the Premier do the honourable thing and apologize to the good Second people time. of Ontario for her disgraceful comments in the week of her yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. I'm very sorry that I used that language. I've said that I've said that a number of times. I shouldn't have used that language. The point I was making, Mr. Speaker, is that as in as Ontarians, as Canadians, we have a lot to do. Our carbon footprint is large, Mr. Speaker, and I was including myself in that uh, in that notion that we as Ontarians living in a northern developed country, Mr. Speaker, we have a large carbon footprint and we can't be complacent even though we 
as the people of Ontario have led, the people of Ontario have supported the shutdown of the coal-fired plants, have supported the renewable industry, Mr. Speaker. But we have more to do. And, Mr. Speaker, what I would say to the uh, party opposite is that I hope that they understand that working collectively, we all have a responsibility to lower our carbon footprint, to get rid of pollution, Mr. Speaker, to reduce greenhouse That's gas it. emissions, because that is that is the responsibility of this generation globally is to make sure we do what we can to make the globe Thank you. New question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Premier. People in the North use more hydro because they lack access to natural gas. They also pay some of the highest hydro rates. On top of this, now some families are getting hit with huge property tax assessment bills, with MPAC claiming that homes in places like Walker's Lake have somehow doubled or tripled in value in just the past four years. I've heard from one senior on a fixed income whose property assessment has increased from under $80,000 to over $180,000. It doesn't make sense, Premier, and she can't afford it. Will the Premier investigate these large impact reassessments in the North? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, yes. The, uh, there have been other situations where there have been um, anomalous situations with, uh, with impact, Mr. Speaker. I know that there were issues around industrial rates. Um, we, will certainly, uh, we will certainly look at, uh, at this situation. I don't have all the details of, uh, of what the member opposite is bringing forward, but I certainly will have a conversation with the Minister of Finance, and we will, uh, we will look at what the situation is, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, these homes are not connected to municipal waters or sewer services. These families have to drive their garbage to the dump. No northern realtor in their right mind would value these properties as MPAC has assessed them. Large industrial property owners have lawyers and experts who can help manage and challenge MPAC assessments. But these families are not wealthy, they can't afford lawyers, and quite frankly, Premier, they're scared. Will the government step up in to helping northern families who have been hit with these huge and unfair MPAC assessments? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, as I said, as I said in the uh, previous answer, we will absolutely look at this. I know that there have been situations where uh, a sort of systemic reassessment needed to happen, and we will absolutely work with MPAC. The Minister of Finance will work with MPAC to determine exactly what's going on, whether this is anomalous, whether there needs to be a, a, a systemic uh, solution to this, Mr. Speaker. But we will we will follow up, and I hope that the uh, hope that the member opposite will uh, uh, give the information that he has to the to the Minister of Finance. Thank you. New question. New question. The member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Mr. Speaker, there's a growing, vibrant Muslim community in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore that's contributing to our province's prosperity and growth. And over the years, the Muslim Canadian community has added much richness to Ontario's cultural fabric with many luminaries in the arts, culture, medicine, and humanitarian areas who have been recognized through various honours, including our very own Order of Ontario, our highest honour. On Thursday, October 6, all three parties came together in this House to pass an important piece of legislation that would recognize October as Islamic Heritage Month in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister share how the legislation will provide uh, Ontarians the opportunity to celebrate important contributions of Canadians practicing the Muslim faith? Thank you. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the dedicated MPP from uh, Etobicoke Lakeshore for his valuable question. <laughs> Diversity has always played an important part in Ontario's culture and heritage. In our province's home, for approximately 55 per cent of the total people of Muslim faith in Canada. Mr. Speaker, in my writing of York Southwestern, I have the distinct honor to represent and serve a vibrant Muslim community alongside Ahmed Hussein, Canada's first ever member of parliament of Somali descent. 
I enjoy a respectful and friendly relationship with many of my Muslim Canadian constituents and regularly participate in a number of events that are uh, put on by the community and the local mosque. Most recently, for example, I had the honour to uh, participate in a barbecue that was hosted yes, by our local mosque, Masjid, uh, Masjid uh, El Noor Mosque. By proclaiming the month of October as Islamic Heritage Month, the province Thank of Ontario you. recognizes the Sorry. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for her response. Uh, our government is committed to uh, educating Ontarians about the rich history and heritage and culture of Canadians of the Muslim faith, as well as other uh, groups. However, systemic racism continues to create barriers that lead to unfair outcomes for racialized and Indigenous people in Ontario. As Ontarians, we know that we've made a great deal of progress on diversity and inclusion, but we still have a lot to do before racialized groups are free to reach their full potential. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what the government is doing to address systemic racism, including Islamophobia, across the province? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And once again, I would like to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for his question. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for your indulgence as I'm fighting a nasty cold, as you can hear. Islamic Heritage Month is not only an opportunity to educate future generations about Ontario's rich history, but also to combat Islamophobia. Recognizing that systemic racism continues to create barriers that lead to unfair outcomes for racialized and indigenous people in Ontario, our Premier appointment appointed the Honourable Michael Cotto as the Minister responsible for anti-racism. The Directorate aims to increase public awareness of racism in order to create a more inclusive province and applies an anti-racism lens in developing, implementing and evaluating government policies, programs and services. Mr. Speaker, our government is strongly committed to addressing systemic racism and we believe that all Ontarians deserve to feel safe and secure so that they can reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, last Thursday, a transport truck hit a guardrail on the westbound lanes of Highway 401 east of Toronto at 4 o'clock in the morning. Thousands of morning commuters were stuck for hours behind the burning truck and its cargo. All express lanes were closed and did not reopen until 3 p.m. I think we can all agree that 11 hours to clear a vital artery is completely unacceptable. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, other major cities have a proper plan to clear their highways in order to minimize the devastating impact of lost revenue and secondary collisions. My private members bill the Highway Incidents Management Act address these concerns with full support from stakeholders at committee. Will the minister please tell us how many more extended highway closures must occur before he will implement these expert recommendations? Thank you. Question, thank you. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from, from Thornhill for her question this morning. Also, of course, uh, I know, uh, as everyone in the House does, that this member brought forward a private member's bill on this general topic a number of months ago. I know there was discussion on that uh, proposed legislation here in the House, Speaker, um, at all times. Uh, and this member would know because she's heard me say it before, as everyone in the House has heard me say it before. Uh, maintaining road and highway safety is perhaps, not perhaps, it is in fact the number one priority for Ontario's Ministry of Transportation. It is, uh, it is why uh, we've worked so hard to make sure that over the last 13 years, our province has been ranked first or second across North America for having highway safety, for having road safety, uh, Speaker. But that doesn't mean that we rest on our laurels. It doesn't mean that we don't continue to look for ways to make sure that at all times those highways are performing as they should, keeping in mind that the safety of the Thanks, traveling sir. public is our number one priority. So. I'd be happy to provide additional information in the follow-up question. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. We don't need additional information. We need to implement the task force. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. The minister was interviewed by News Talk 1010 at lunchtime last Thursday and claimed he was doing, and I quote, everything possible to clear the road. Many hours later, his quote was still being replayed as though it was part of some kind of comedy skit. 
The talk show hosts repeatedly asked why we are not moving forward to better use available technology while implementing a system similar to Florida, where specialized teams are responsible for specific sections of the highway and are given only 90 minutes to clear the lanes. Will the minister please admit that 11 hours to clear the lanes was completely unacceptable and agree to implement what has full support from CAA, our first responders and the tow truck industry representatives? This would be a task force of experts to immediately work out a better plan to Question. deal with disruptions of our vital arterial roads. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up question. Uh, what I didn't say in my original answer, which I, I want to emphasize now, of course, Speaker, is that the Ministry of Transportation works very closely with law enforcement on all of these matters, on all of these initiatives to make sure <clears throat> that we're able to reopen highways, roads, etc., that might be affected by accidents. Speaker, I should point out that at all times the Ministry of Transportation uh, holds our first responders in the highest regard with respect to the work that they do to make sure that we can reopen highways uh, when it is safe. I think for everyone in this House, including that member, Speaker, the number one priority should be the safety of the traveling public. We don't make a unilateral decision at the ministry as to when a highway should reopen. We do that in consultation with the OPP because, of course, Speaker, uh, the OPP would be best positioned to let us know when it is most safe to reopen a highway. Having said that, Answer. I'll take uh, I'll take under advisement the uh, the message being delivered by the member today, and we'll look forward to having continued discussions to make sure that we can maintain our priority uh, on road safety and keep the uh, the highways moving. New Thanks question. very much, Speaker. The member from Hamilton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, traffic on Hamilton area highways is getting worse by the minute, leaving people with less and less time to spend with their families. One of the worst pinch points is where the Red Hill Valley Parkway and the QEW meet. The province began studying solutions in 2007. A report has been on the minister's desk for years. Yet here we are nine years later and no action. When will the province start its engine and make this priority for residents and businesses in Hamilton and Niagara? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Hamilton for his uh, for his question, of course, <clears throat> at all times on this side of the House, Speaker, making sure that we continue to invest significant amounts of money and resources in Ontario's highway infrastructure is something that's extremely important to me as Minister and to everyone again on this side of the House, Speaker. I should point out that in 2016 and 17, thanks to the leadership of our Premier, we are investing just under $3 billion across wow. the province in highways and bridges, Speaker. I will also point out that that number specifically includes about $1.6 billion for highways in southern Ontario. Speaker, I'm well aware of the challenges that are felt in Hamilton and throughout the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. I've heard that from a number of colleagues on this side of the House. We'll continue to work with the municipality, with motorists and other commuters in that lovely part of the GTHA to make yes, sure sir. that we get it right. And I suspect that we'll have updates coming relatively shortly. Thanks very much, Thank Speaker. You, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, there are houses going up all through eastern Stony Creek and the Grimsby area. Traffic congestion is going to get worse. The Red Hill Valley and the Lincoln Alexander Parkway are vital to both residents and businesses in the Hamilton area. Last Wednesday, Hamilton City Council asked the province to get on with easing the congestion immediately. Will the minister finally commit to starting an environmental assessment for the widening of the QEW at the Freeman Interchange to the Red Hill Valley Parkway? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up question. As I mentioned in my original answer, of course, we'll continue to work with the municipality to make sure that we can get shovels in the ground when it is appropriate to do so, Speaker. I do want to take just a moment to point out, I guess to emphasize, Speaker, uh, the ongoing uh, extraordinary commitment that the Ontario government has, that our Premier has, with respect to making sure that we are supporting highway expansion and extensions and enhancements, at the same time, Speaker, is making sure that we continue to invest in public transit. In Hamilton, specifically, Speaker, that member would know that we announced a number of months ago that we'll be extending GO service uh, all the way to Niagara Falls, Speaker, wow. but, in the, but in the interim, Speaker, we're going to be building a brand new station in Stony Creek specifically in that member's riding. At the same time, Speaker, he would be well aware of the fact that the Answer. province of Ontario is investing $1 billion in Hamilton's LRT project, Speaker. So, all in all, all, in all we understand Thank the you. challenges that are being felt in Hamilton. Thank you. The uh, member from Haldeman, Norfolk. Order, uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you.
never too late. <coughs> never too late. The member from Holloman and Norfolk on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I regret to inform this legislature that uh, former parliamentarian MPP Peter Preston, <coughs> he was elected in 1995, uh, has passed away. Our uh, thoughts and prayers are, are with Peter's uh, family and his uh, many, many friends. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.